guys stand up with us? Happy Easter, happy Resurrection Sunday this morning.
bosom that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night and through. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, and Jesus Christ, my living So great a mercy, what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame.
Grace decided just not to behave that morning. And all eternity called you by name, but nothing would ever be the same. When all things became new, yes, that morning. That morning when God thought of you. That morning when the stone was removed. That morning when the corpse decided to do what it wasn't supposed to do. Yes, that morning when prophecy came true. That morning when two mourning women came to the tomb to take care of the dead, looking for the one with the number of hairs on his head. They didn't find that one, but instead, what they found that morning was a wonderful message to spread. That morning, death became like a defaced snake, could no longer lay stake or claim to you or your name that morning. God saw your hurts, your pain, our shame, our sin, and he took his creation, his wonderful work of art, and he placed it in the frame and said that morning, this is why I came. The rising sun, the barrel undone, the victory won. That morning is like this morning. And yes, pure heart church, he is saying, come to me, all weary and heavy burden. Why do you look for the living amongst the dead? Our God is alive. Declare this together. The cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. Sorrow may come, the darkest night, but the cross has the final. Come on, if you believe it, let's sing it out. The cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. Mm -hmm. Evil may birth is strong.
got to have it. Amen. Amen. That is really why we have Easter services. We have Easter services. Not so we can pack out the place or see how many people we can get through the doors. We have Easter services because we are flat out in love with Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And we want every single person to know if you're here today, this is what we are all about. We want you to know how much our God loves you. And how much His love has changed my life and has changed our lives. We are different because of His love. Because of the life that He has given us. Amen. I'm living my best life because of my Jesus. Amen. And His death and His resurrection that I now get to participate in. Amen? Yeah. Amen. You can have a seat. Every week as part of our worship, we gather together and we pray for other churches. We pray for other pastors. Because we know that it is not just about us. It is not just about pure heart in the kingdom of God. It is bigger than us. And so we link arms with other churches. And all across the world and all across the country, churches are gathering today to celebrate the resurrection of our Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And so I specifically want to pray for our churches in our Better Together Network, where we have relationships with churches across the city, and we have um, connections with them, and we, we bind together in ministry for the kingdom of God. And I also want to pray for the churches uh, in, in Sri Lanka. Uh, they've experienced tragedy this morning as, as terrorist attacks, and hundreds of people have lost their lives this morning as they, as they worshipped in church. Would you join me as we pray? Our Father God, we know you are good. And we say it again, we know you are good. But we know that, that things in this world, they don't always seem good. And so, God, we, we thank you for your provision. We thank you for your lordship. That even in situations that bring about unspeakable pain, God, that you are still good. You are still holy. And you have never left us. And, God, so we pray for the families. And we pray for those churches. We pray for those pastors that have experienced tragedy this morning. God, would you bring your peace and your presence in only a way that you can. And God, we pray for every single church gathering this Easter. We pray for every single pastor speaking your word, that every single person who walks onto the campus of a church feels your love. And every single pastor preaching today, that they would speak your words, not theirs, but that your words and your life and your love would impact the hearts of your people. We love what you are doing. And we love that we get to be a part of it. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. 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 I'd like to invite the ushers to come forward to receive this morning's tithes and offerings. One thing we say around here all the time is if Pure Heart was gone tomorrow, would our community miss us? And there's three main ways that we go about this, um, whether it be uh, impacting our local schools or in the area of mental health and addiction or in our resource center and our food pantry. In our resource center, well, we see about 18, eight, 1,875 people a month, and about 200 of those people are under the age of five, and we help feed them. But we also help people with job postings, resumes, bus passes, blood pressure. We have chaplains on site for prayer, financial, financial counseling, and sometimes we just hang out and we just talk. We also were involved in our local schools through this thing called School Connect. We're partnering with other organizations, 572 organizations, 350 churches. And with those partnerships, we are able to be involved and bless and minister to 460 public schools. Give God a yeah, hand for that. Yeah. That's amazing. And in the area of mental health, we are working on equipping uh, over 70 churches to become what we call trauma-informed. And what that means is that we know that every single person who walks in the doors of a church, they have a story. And so instead of asking things like, hey, uh, what's, what's wrong with you? We say things like, hey, what, what happened to you? What's your story? How can we walk alongside you as you begin to heal and move toward health in the way that only God intended? Your generosity helps impact those areas. If we were gone, we'd be missing to say yes. That's the kind of life we want to live. Would you pray with me? Father God, we count it a blessing to be generous to you, to be generous to your kingdom, to be generous to the things that you care about. 
God, would you bless these tithes and offerings and would you multiply them and use them in, in just incredible ways, in only ways that you can. Thank you that we get to participate in this. In Jesus' name, and everybody said it. Amen. Amen. And Crossroads Recovery, we love you guys. Give Crossroads a good hand this morning. So I want to start off this 2019 Easter service, and I want to ask you a very important question. Who is the person in your life that gets the most excited, has the most passion when you come into the room? Who is the person, when they see you, they just light up, and you like to get around them because you like it when somebody gets excited to see you. Can I get a yes from anybody this morning? Who is that person? Tell your neighbor right now, and don't say your dog, okay? Let's do this. Not just your dog, all right? I know my dog loves me, okay? Who is it that gets the most excited? Tell your neighbor, tell your neighbor. Maybe mom, maybe friend, all right? See, this human experience of passion is deep in who we are. I married a, a passionate Italian woman, Nicole Marie Parati. I married her. And I never have to wonder what she's thinking. She's very passionate, all right? She sent me a t-shirt picture from Chicago the other day. This is what she did in Chicago with Abby. She said, I'm not young. I'm Italian, all right? And all the Italians said, there you go. Exactly. So this human expression that we have of passion is deep inside of us. And we're passionate about so many things. We're passionate about our sports teams. What's your sports team? Yell it out. What's your sports team? Oh, oh my goodness. Oh, my goodness. It's a good thing you're here to meet Jesus today. That's good stuff. All right. And so food, we're passionate about food. What's your food you're passionate about? Anything? Great. Yeah, all right. Yeah. We're going to have some ravioli, some Italian food this afternoon. I can't wait for that. We're passionate about our kids and our grandkids. How many of you have pictures right now on your phone at the ready to show somebody who just pretends to ask? Anybody? That's good. Just show your name. Show your name with the pictures. How many love pets? Any pet lovers in the room? How many of you are dog lovers? Show shout out. How many cat? cat yeah. Got it. It's usually a higher stream. That's right. Cat, cat lovers. All right. How many love both? Because you don't want to hurt your pet's feelings. Okay. That's good. We have both dog and a cat. How many like to watch? Like you get passionate about politics. Anybody? Yeah. Okay. One person. <laughs> That's one person right there. That's good stuff. We'll move on from that one right there. Thank you, Mandy, for your passion this morning, all right? You see, but we show passion differently to varying degrees. How many of you how many of your extroverts give a shout? Yeah! You're passionate, we all know it. How many of your introverts just nod slightly? Because I already traumatized you by asking you to talk to your neighbor, so you're already having some trouble this morning with that. I believe that our ability to show passion is rooted deeply in our hearts. I'll say that it's part of our DNA. I'll go further to say that it's part of who God is himself. It's part of his, how what we've been made in his image to do is to express passion. It's part of our identity, if you will. And next weekend, the weekend after, we're going to talk more about this identity that God has given us. And who he says that we are versus what the culture says that we are. I'm going to think that would be important to talk about that for a couple of weeks. You see, we have a passionate creator. You don't make sunrises and sunsets and vast oceans and snow-capped mountains, male, female, peacocks, pythons, Mexican food, and chocolate turtle cheesecake unless you are a passionate creator. And because, because we are passionately created, we have a deep need for someone to be passionate about us. I can't even begin to describe to you the passion I felt when I first held our three children in our hands, my hands for the first time. They put Josh in my hands and Luke in my hands and Abigail in my hands for the first time. So much passion, such deep love for my kids. Every birthday, we celebrate the moment they were born. We talk about the moment they were born. We talk about that moment when they came out and we, we saw them and we held them and we, we begged the doctors to clean them up before we held them. And we, we just talk about what it was like and Josh's cone head and Luke's little head that was all messed up on top and how beautiful Abby was and perfect because she was the girl, all right? Just absolutely perfect. Uh, speaking of when our kids were born, I remember Nicole said to me before our firstborn, Josh, she said to me, she goes, honey, 
I need you to coach well. I'm like, I'm in. I'm all in. I'm your greatest coach. She goes, here's the deal. I don't want an epidural. I'm going to do this naturally. And I said, why? And she said, because it's better for the baby to do this naturally. She says, I don't want drugs. And I go, can I have them? Just, just put the epidural here and let it go all the way down my body. I don't care. It's going to be an overwhelming experience for both of us. I know, I know it's more about you right now, but I'm a little concerned. And so she said, whatever happens, coach me through it. So I get to the hospital. We're, we're ready to roll. And the first big contractions hit. Wow! And she gets quiet. And when my Italian wife gets quiet, it's not good. Okay? And I climb up on the bed. I'm ready to coach. I climb up on the bed. And I get down next to her. And I go, you can't do this. And she took her Italian fingers. She placed them in my face. And she pushed my face away from her face. And I kind of sulked off the bed. And I found a chair. And I sat down. And she rolled over in the midst of another contraction. And she looked at me and she said, I cannot be responsible for your feelings right now. <laughs> Passion. And no matter how old we get, we still need people to be passionate about us. My, my mom, she'll say to me, Congo, I'll say goodbye, I'll hug her, and kiss her, say goodbye. Then she'll talk to one of the grandkids and she'll look at me and she'll go, you didn't say goodbye. I'm like, I, I, I gave you Come on, bring it in. Another hug, another kiss. Talk to two more grandkids. Turn around and go, we'll say goodbye. I'm like, okay, mom. I'll say goodbye one more time. She just wants to know that I'm passionate about her. Nicole will ask me from time to time. She goes, do you still think I'm beautiful? Why, why do you love me so much? And she just wants to know that after 21 years, I'm still passionate about her. And I am. And I have to admit that at 21 years of marriage, I still need to know that she's passionate about me. I'll be in the kitchen getting something to drink, a glass of almond milk or something like that. <laughs> in the 21st century, we milk almonds now, okay? And so I'm getting some almond milk, and I'll be standing there, she'll, she'll come up and she'll grab my arm. She's like, oh, you're so strong. I'm like, well, that's not actually my most dominant arm. Try this one. Bam! And then and she, 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 she's like, and then she's like you, oh, baby, you're so strong. And then she gives me that look, and married men, you know the look. Can I get a little? from married men in the room. That look that makes you want to ask, should I brush my teeth? That's the look! That settle down. It's Easter sunrise service, all right? It's Easter, it's early. It's for sure. All right. That's the look, the passion. And so today we're going to talk about the one who has the most passion for you and for me. And if there's ever a day that reminds us someone is passionate about us, it's Easter. See, Jesus is for us, and he's passionately against what hurts us. Can I get an amen from anybody this morning? Amen. Let's just read that together. Ready, go. Jesus, Jesus is for us, us and passionately against what hurts us. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's so true. See, and I, I'm also aware that there's some of you today that have been hurt deeply. Someone was supposed to love you. Someone was supposed to be passionate about you. But maybe they abandoned you. Maybe you were hurt by a church. It was supposed to be a safe place, but you were hurt by a church. And we're so sorry for your pain. We really are, but we are so glad that you chose to be here today. Um, I don't know why, I don't know how you got here. I know maybe some of you, you showed up today because <laughs> you just had to get a family member to stop bugging you to come to church. Nervous laughter across the room. And no matter how you got here, it doesn't stop the fact that God wanted you here today. He wanted to slow your roll down long enough to remind you that he's flat out in love with you. And he's passionate about you. He wants to call your heart home to his. So today we're going to look at a story. One of my favorite stories in the Bible. It's the, it's the this, uh, it's a story of the resurrection. But not the resurrection that you first think about. It's the resurrection before the resurrection. The story is found in John chapter 11. So everybody in the house, go to John chapter 11. Follow along in your bulletin notes. Also, the scriptures will be on the screens. The Bibles in the backs of the chair are free. And so are the pens. Just for Easter weekend. All right? So grab a pen if you need one as well. We're going to be in John chapter 11. This is the Gospel of John, the story of Jesus' relationship with three family members who he loved deeply. Mary, Martha, and their brother, Lazarus. And Jesus loves them deeply. They are family to him. Now, Lazarus gets extremely sick. And Mary and Martha sin for Jesus. But before Jesus can get there, by the time Jesus gets there, Lazarus has already died. 
He's actually been in the tomb for four days. When Jesus arrives, the people are mourning all around the tomb. Martha goes out to meet Jesus. Mary stays at home. Listen to Martha and what she says when she confronts Jesus. John 11, we're going to be in verse 21 to start. She says this, Lord, Martha said, if you, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Martha's not alone in this. All of us have had those if you moments with Jesus. Oh, Jesus, if, if you just healed my mom's cancer or got me the job or protected my child. Oh, God, if you just would have done this, then that wouldn't have happened. Can anybody relate to that today? We've all had those moments of questioning, God, why did you do it the way that you did it? But Mar what Martha says next shows a lot about her great faith in Jesus. Verse 22, she says this, but I know, I know that even now, I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask for. Watch Jesus respond, verse 23. Jesus said, your brother will rise again, Martha. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. I know that one day he'll rise again. I just want it to be today. And Jesus responds with these words, powerful. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die, Martha. Do you believe this, Martha? And Martha says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Martha's like, listen, Jesus, this isn't about my faith in you. I believe that you're able to do all things. This is an issue of reality for me. Why did you let my brother die? Why did you take so long to get here? And maybe for some of us, we can relate to that today. It's not about, is God able to do it? It's about, why hasn't he done it. Now Martha leaves the scene and she goes home and she gets her sister Mary and says, the teacher, Jesus is here. And the people follow Mary out. They think that she's going to the tomb to mourn for her brother Lazarus. She's actually going to confront Jesus herself as well. Verse 32. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was, she saw him. She fell at his feet and she said, Lord, it's in these words, if you if you had been here, my brother would not have died. The very same words that Martha used. But Jesus' response is very, very different. This whole conversation with Mary has a whole different tone to it than Jesus' conversation with Martha. And when Jesus saw her weeping, everybody read that with me. When Jesus saw her weeping, read it again. When Jesus saw her weeping. And the Jews who came along with her weeping. He was deeply moved in his spirit. And he was troubled. Where have you laid him? And Mary says, come and see, Lord. And watch what Jesus does. Read this with me. Ready, go. Jesus wept. Say it again. Jesus wept. See, when Martha speaks, it's almost like Jesus begins to argue or push back on her. She says, if you would have been here, Jesus. And Jesus says, Martha, I'm the resurrection and the life. Martha, it's never too late with me. The flow of Martha's heart is towards despair. And Jesus is pushing against that flow. He's pushing back on doubt, wanting to give her great hope. But when Mary, when Mary says the exact same thing, Jesus doesn't push back. He enters in. He enters right into her pain. And he stands alongside of her and he weeps with her. This is not, in the Greek, this is not just the word for just a little tear coming out of your eye. Out of your eye. He is weeping. It is visible that he is shaken by what is happening in the pain of the people around him. And this response fascinates me. Because think about this for a second. If you have the ability to raise someone from the dead, and you know that just in a few moments, you are going to raise that person from the dead. Those of you who have never heard this story before, spoiler alert, Lazarus is going to rise from the dead. Turn to your neighbor and go, shoot, he gave it away. All right. So, yeah, if you knew you could raise someone from the dead, and you knew you were going to raise Lazarus from the dead, what would your emotions be? You might not be able to contain the joy. You might be smiling from ear to ear, which would look ridiculous to everybody around you in that moment. And here's Jesus not smiling, not, 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 oh, not overcome with joy. Here's Jesus entering into their pain, knowing what he's about to do. Why would he do that? Why would he cry in that moment? Why would he weep in that moment? I mean, I don't know about you, but what would your reaction be? Maybe you would speak with an elevated tone. Remember, I am the resurrection and the life. That's not what Jesus 
does, in my interactions with people who have experienced trauma, 25 years of ministry, I have found that very, very rarely do they doubt God's power. They just struggle with, does he see me? Does he see what I'm going through? Does he care? In that moment, Jesus, knowing he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead, knowing he was going to glorify himself, in that moment, Jesus enters into her pain and just meets with her. Tears rolling down his face. I sat with a group of pastors this last week. The pastors in Covenant and we were talking about life and talking about childhood and we got into the story of fathers. It was an interesting conversation. I always think it's a holy moment when grown men are willing to talk about their childhood and talk about the past and talk about things they've been through. Some of the guys had great stories, phenomenal stories of fathers who loved them and they were all in. Some had absolutely devastating stories. One of my friends was quiet most of the time. And finally, he kind of spoke up. He said, you know, guys, it's interesting. I'm really torn. He said, my father was always present. He was at every game. He was at every event. My father provided for us financially. My father was always present physically. He said, what I wrestled with, and I've always wrestled with, is he was never present with me emotionally. I never knew how my father felt about me. When I hurt, I saw no emotion. When I was joyful, I saw no emotion. I never saw my father's passion for me. Jesus, who represents Father God, Jesus, who is God in the flesh, stands beside those who are lonely. And he meets with them. Tears rolling down his face. And listen to what the people who watch Jesus do this. Listen to what they say right after they see him weeping. They say this in verse 36. As in the Jews said, see how he loved him? Do you, do you, do you see? And then they go into questioning his motives and questioning some other things. We don't want to get into all of that right now. And it goes on in verse 38. But Jesus' passion and his love was just beginning to show that he had seen nothing yet. Jesus came to the tomb. He says, take away the stone. And then Martha speaks up. Very interesting moment. Let's just check this out for a second. Martha speaks up and she says, ah! There's a bad odor. He's been in the grave for four days. Jesus, don't roll away the stone. It's going to stinketh in there. Those of you who need the King James this morning because you want to relive your roots, I just want to give that to you, all right? It stinketh, Lord. We cannot do this. You have no idea what it's going to smell of like it, okay? And Jesus looks at Martha and he says, did I not tell you that if you believe, I like how he uses if you are her. <laughs> that great turns right around. That if you believe, that if you believe, you will see the glory of God. And they take away the stone, and Jesus looks up to heaven and he says this in verse 41 Father, I thank you that you've heard me. Oh, I, I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of those standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And here it comes, here it comes, here it comes. The moment we've all been waiting for, Jesus called out in a loud voice Lazarus! Come out. And the dead man came out, hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen, cloth around his face. Can you picture the scene? Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus comes out of here. Hello, here I am. I, what was that like? <laughs> wrapped in strips of cloth. And Jesus looks at the people and he says this. He says, take off the grave clothes and set him free. Take off the grave clothes and let him go. And those of you who are visiting today, can I just say how honored we would be at Pure Heart? That if you come into contact with the Jesus that we know and love, that you would give us the privilege going forward to walk with you, to encourage you, and to help you take off some of those old broken pieces of your life. And everybody that calls Pure Heart home said, Amen. We would be so honored to love you and walk with you and help you. And so it's a miracle. Jesus is the Messiah, the power of God in flesh. And this is where most people stop. But this isn't why I chose this story. It's so much deeper than just the resurrection of Lazarus. I chose this story for a much deeper reason. And it's found in verse 38. And verse 38, this is what is recorded by John. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. Everybody say deeply moved. There's a Greek word in here that literally means to... Bellow with anger. When Jesus gets to the tomb, he is furious. He's bellowing. He's raging. He's roaring. 
Jesus looks at our greatest nightmare, death, and he is incensed. I have an 1884 edition of Webster's Dictionary. The definition of passion is this in the 1884 dictionary. It says this, strong feeling prompting to action, anger, wrath, and love. You see, this is the moment that set in motion the moment when Jesus would show his ultimate passion that would give us our ultimate freedom in life on the cross. And the reason I know this is because the religious leaders see Jesus' power. They see this miracle and they go, this miracle will make him more dangerous than ever. And so in verse 53, later on in this chapter, they gather together and this is what it says in verse 53. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. You see, Jesus knew something. He knew that the only way he could bring Lazarus out of the grave was to put himself in it. He knew that once he raised Lazarus from the grave, he would speed up his own execution. He knew that this miracle and this event would be the final straw, and the religious leaders would say, Enough! He's going to deceive people. And this moment would speed up his crucifixion. Up to then, they liked to plot different things. Up to then, they liked to harass him and ask questions. Up to then, he was just a good teacher who did some amazing things. But he just raised a man from the dead. And that was a game changer for them. And it was a game changer for us. It's a game changer for everyone who loved Christ, who lost their life in Chicago this morning. Because they are not dead. Their last breath in this life was followed by their first inhale in the presence of Christ because Jesus said, Paul said, to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. Amen. Resurrection is a game changer. Death is just a veil we pass through. It's a horrific event. But we don't mourn as those without hope because we know that this life is not God's final answer. Amen. Yeah. yeah, great job. Jesus knew the only way that he could interrupt Lazarus' funeral was to summon his own. He knew it would cost him everything. And yet he cried out anyway, Lazarus, come out. And the witnesses said, see how he loved Lazarus. But what I would say to us this Easter morning is see how he loves us. The cross is personal. It's Jesus' greatest passion for us. No one is more passionate for us than he is. No one has loved us to that extent. The Apostle Paul was so overwhelmed by the love of Christ, he says to his, the church in Rome as he wrote the letter to them in chapter 8, he said, I am convinced. I am convinced that neither death nor life, angels, demons, present, future, any powers, height or death, anything else at all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm convinced, Paul said, no one loves me like Christ. <clears throat> so what do we do? What, what, do you, what do we do with this kind of passion? There's two things. The first thing is we embrace it. The first thing that we do is we embrace his love. We don't push away from his love. We don't reject his love. We don't stay apathetic about his love. We embrace him. We thank him. Receive his love. And so let's take that first step right now. Would you, would you bow your heads with me all across the room? We just have a moment on the same. Oh Lord Jesus, thank you for your love. Thank you for your hope. Thank you for your joy and your peace. And even when life is painful, you are so good. But you came into this broken world to our hurts and our pain. You showed your great passion for us. For some of you sitting here today and some of you listening online, I want to give you the opportunity to make the greatest decision of your life, to receive the love of Jesus Christ, to accept Him as your Lord and Savior, and to make this commitment today, the greatest commitment of your life, to say, Jesus, I'm going to follow you, and I want to know you. I don't think there's a better time of the year to receive Christ than on Easter. So that's you today. 
listening online, there's a little button that came up on your screen that says, Today I put my trust in Christ. I would encourage you. Would you click that button right now? In just a moment, I'd like you to pray with the rest of us here in the auditorium. For the rest of us sitting here today, you're ready to make this decision to love Christ, to follow Christ, maybe for the first time. Or maybe for you, it's more of a rededication of your life to Christ. You've been doing your own thing and going your own way. And you thought you came here today just because you wanted to get a family member to stop bugging you. But no, you're here for a bigger reason. You're here because God wanted a moment to slow you down and say, I love you. Would you come home to me? What are you saying to you? I, I know that you've hurt. I know you have discouragement. I know there's things that I've, things that have happened in your life and you question me. I love you. I'm sorry for your pain. I want you to come home to me. I want to take that brokenness. I want to do something beautiful with it. I want to take that pain. I want to use it to help other people. I love you. So if that's you today, first time or maybe today's a rededication of your life to Christ. With heads bowed all across this room, what we do in this safe place is we raise our hand high. We're ready to make that decision. We raise our hand high. If that's you today, without hesitation, you just raise your hand up and say, that's me. I need Christ today. Yes, God. Just raise him up. Yes, and yes, and yes. Come on, keep raising. Anyone else? Come to this section. Yes. Yes, I see you. Anyone else? Yeah, I'm here, but I see you. Yeah, yeah, I see you. Fantastic. All of you with your hands. Yeah, I see you back. All of you with your hands raised. Put them down right now. Pray this in your heart. Pray this online. Pray this in your heart. Say this, Lord Jesus, right now in this moment, I commit my life to you. Jesus, I trust you with my life. Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Jesus, fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your presence, with your hope, with your love, with your joy, your peace, your healing. Fill me with your presence, Lord. I need you, Father. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Let's give God a huge hand today. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. The first thing is to embrace his love. The second thing is something we've never done as a church. All of you received these strips of cloth when you came in today. Would you just take them right now? Wave them like you're in a Pentecostal church. Come on, wave them like that. All right. <laughs> so what we're going to do today is we go back into worship. Because we're going to take a moment and take a physical step to mark a spiritual moment in our lives. I asked you at the beginning of the message, who's that person that's most passionate about you in life? Let me ask you the question in a little different way. What do you think that person who's most passionate about you, most passionately wants for you? What do they want for you in life? I know that for our three children, Josh, Luke, and Abigail, what I want for them more than anything else is I want them to be free. I want them to be free. I, my greatest passion is that they're free from guilt and shame and sin and regret and fear and bitterness and greed and lust, depression, anxiety, addiction, and the pain of trauma. Not that they will go through trauma. We all go through trauma. But the brokenness of trauma that keeps us trapped, I want them free from that. It's okay if they're sweetly broken, but I don't want them to be bitterly broken. We all get broken in this world. Can I get an amen? You know, this is not heaven. But I want them to be sweetly broken. Free from the bitterness of that hurt. To help others with the pain that they're going through in their lives. So, what is it in your life today? What area, one area, do you need to find freedom? What area of your life you can take off an old piece of grave clothes that's still hanging on you. And walk in the freedom that Christ has purchased for you through His death, burial, and resurrection. Would you stand with me all across the room, those of you who are What we're going to ask you to do today, go back into worship, it's such a powerful song, is to come down when you're ready and place that piece of grave cloth on the cross, declaring, that's the area of my life that I'm going to walk in freedom. No more is that going to control me. Then I'd like to go back to your seats and just continue to worship, because this is such a powerful, powerful song. Here we go.
shame, without guilt. He says, come to me. All who are weary, come to me and I will give you rest. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hey, if you raise your hand today, that is the best decision you will ever make in this lifetime. And we want to walk with you. If you made that decision online, please click the button. Fill out the form. Watch the video. We want to be part of your journey. If you raise your hand in the auditorium, there's going to be someone who comes up to you, gets some information from you. Um, or if someone doesn't make it to you, please text your first name to this number on the screen. Because no one walks alone. We want to be part of your journey. We're also going to have pastors and chaplains in the lobby to pray with you, to talk with you, anything that you need. And any guests or visitors here today, thank you. You could have been anywhere else this morning, and you chose to be here. Give it up to our guests. And our we love you guys. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. Please fill out the Connect card in the seat back of your chairs. We'd love to connect with you and give you some more information, what we're all about, and what you need as well. Now, right now, we have three people who are being baptized right on the patio, right after this service. We're also going to be we're having it on the patio, but we're also going to be showing it on the main screen. So you can hang out, watch them here, or you can go out on the patio. Father God, thank you for every single thing you have done today, every single thing that you have done, and every single thing that you will do. You are good. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, for me, for us, to die the death that we deserved, to live the life that we, that we didn't deserve, God, because of your grace and your mercy and your love. Thank you that we get to walk out this resurrection life, not just after we die, but right here, right now. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. If you walk down the grid, I'm walking too. If you walk down the grid, I'm walking too.